dealing with a, with a man of many talents, somebody who um, can really burn, really plugs into a certain frequency on the bandstand, uh, and the sound that emanates from him is uh, somewhere between this high, lonesome country burn and jazz, Herb Ellis style. Um, the only person that, there's a lot of people that I think about when it comes to frequency, uh, but when I watched this cat in a certain setting last night, uh, on a video, it just reminded me of my spiritual teacher to C.G. Munoz uh, in the sense of just, it just seemed like pure light, pure centrifugal force. And uh, and on top of that, he also has to do all the other, other stuff that is required by artists like uh, booking Andy Hess's tickets to uh, go around the world to be able to play beautiful music for, and uplift people all over this world. Jim Campolongo, welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Uh, thanks for having me, Jake. And yeah, I don't know if this like officially started now, but we were just, I was- uh, uh, now, I want you to talk about when, because that was an East Coast uh, production. When did that, because there's, there's this, there's this kind of like, don't, don't let the devil take your mother or something. I forget the name of the tune, but- Well, there was like, don't let the dragon- That's it. Um, I think, Don't let the dragon eat your mother. Yeah, I, I can't remember if, I think it might be the title track, Devotion. I know exactly where it is and can grab it. But yeah, yeah the John McLaughlin Devotion record I got when I was 12 years old um, and loved it. And I still listen to it. I think it's great. I really like those pre-Mahavishnu uh, McLaughlin albums. I love the Mahavishnu records. I love Shakti. Uh, you know, McLaughlin played with Miles Davis. Um, I mean, McLaughlin, he played on a Joe Farrell song of the wind. Dude, I want, I need you to stop right there because I got to tell you something. So devotion <laughs> in full disclosure it, to my, I mean, McLaughlin always has had this angular way of playing that is, is just interesting to me. And I can't say it's like, like my go-to stuff, but that th this album in particular, this, sort of psych blues jazz this devotion is always been a little bit outside my bag but the one the the my favorite mclaughlin solo and i and i gotta send you the interview because it's kind of a convoluted story but when i did my second interview with him uh follow your heart on on joe fair that that's the that title track yeah it's really uh, fantastic that is the most amazing McLaughlin so it's the most translatable to my year and what's really interesting about that so I asked him and he was stunned but it's another album that I'm sure Campolongo lived on was an album he did with a bunch of British cats called Extrapolation on, oh yeah on now if you go back and listen I, I, I you may already know this but when I I said what's the deal here man because there's a tune on there that is the same as Follow Your Heart. It's called Arjun's Bag. That's right. Right? And he's Similar. like, Jake? <laughs> no, I, and I got to bring up the quote, but he cracked me up. I, I asked him, I said, this is the same tune? So he said when he got in the studio with Joe, because Chick was really instrumental in getting McLaughlin. Tony Williams was too, but Chick got him on that date. And Joe's like, hey, man, you know, I don't, does anybody have any tunes? I need a tune. And McLaughlin's like, well, I, I got this tune, but it's in eleven. Right. And he's like, well, you know, and, and it was a monster key for the tenor sax. Anyway, that tune, and I like it better than the Arjun Bad. That tune is just like burnt, like the sickest McLaughlin I've ever heard in my life. Anyway, th that it's so great that you know that because those pre-Maha things are, are hard to come by. Yeah, that tune is an 11. Um, the rhythm section really speeds up, too, which is interesting. Uh, you know, I mean, if you listen to, th listen to it for that, um, it is a great solo. He uses space. It's very patient. Um, I mean, I'm a big McLaughlin fan. Um, and talk about, I, well, I want to talk about like, what was it? Or, Cause I'm not talking now you were on the ground floor when those records were coming in and I've talked to a lot of badass. I don't know if you ever knew Jack Wilkins, great guitar player in New York. Oh yeah, he just passed away. 
I mean, an, an alleged. I, I, mean, I got to say you that interview. Le- yeah, I took lessons with Jack. This is this is so. I mean, it can't be longer. I mean, this is you are like making my year. But the point is that he <clears throat> he was like, and we had this great interview because a lot of people don't know he played he played jazz with Barry Manilow, you know, way back when, which was so sick. But he was a, he's really a straight ahead guy, and he goes, you know, I always he goes, they have impeccable time. He's talking about McLaughlin and Demiola. He goes, but the beat falls in the weirdest places. He's like, I've transcribed their interviews, but it just doesn't. He goes, and their time is impeccable, but the beat is just falling in odd places for him. So for you, when those records came out, what was so scintillating? Just take McLaughlin. What was so scintillating about that? Follow your heart, Jack Johnson to a degree. Uh, you know, just that. Even the Devotion album. What was it that was so refreshing for you? Well, the Jack, the Johnston album is what I call like you know the uh, you know introduction. Sorry, that's me. I got an email from a hotel. Yeah, um, part of the job. Yeah, um, you know because it's accessible, like Jack Johnston. But I kind of intuitively liked it because I, I didn't play guitar yet. I, I, you know, when I got at least two of those records, Extrapola- Extrapolation and uh, Devotion, I, I got them when I was like 12, maybe 17. <laughs> and Dude, I mean, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, it's funny, right? You know, okay. Well, now, hold on. I, Why were you even, what, like, how did you even get hit? Yeah, I'm going to answer that. Yeah, all right, yeah. Um, I what I would did was I didn't know anything, uh, so I'd go look through records, and if a, a record had one or two tracks on a side, I'd buy it. Right, because it had it, it could have, it, you knew it had improvisation. Right, and I didn't even know what improvisation was. Right, like, of course. You know, I mean, so when I'm twelve. I'm buying, I've got, I thought I mentioned this, but John Coltrane live in Japan. Um, so, it, you know, it wasn't just limited to guitar, but it was definitely directed towards guitar. Um, I got John McLaughlin Devotion. I got a, a Larry Coriel record called Barefoot Boy. Um, Boy, absolutely. Yeah, that's not like, you know, at the forefront of anybody. I mean, I got like Rare Earth live in concert and I didn't like it but I still listened to it for like a month and a half, you know, because it was $2.98, you know? It's just, it's, it's just insane. Yeah, but I ended up like really lucking out. And in some ways, like now that I'm an older man and like have what 12 and 13 years old is in perspective, I, I really like got to hand it to that kid, you know, who was me. So anyway, that's how I heard that stuff. Got you want? The- I want to be clear though. I, that when you like, you were not into even at that age. It didn't matter about theory or what was happening or what things meant. You weren't interested in these canned three or four minute radio play hits on on records. You didn't unless want unless it was unless it was the Beatles. Right. I was totally uninterested. Um, you know, not totally. I liked some. Uh, uh, I remember liking Smile, A Little Smile for Me, Rosemary. Yeah. You know? um, I mean, not everything was, you know, super high level, but it kind of was like looking back, like the first LP I got in my life was Jimi Hendrix's Greatest Hits. Uh, and this is before I played. Um, you know, so there was some kind of. No, and I had no, you know, I didn't like John McLaughlin devotion because I thought like it was an interesting time signature or Larry <laughs> Young was, you know, oh, what an interesting Lydian mode. You know, I just dug it. Um, and I dug that it was long and kind of a journey, you know, and once in a while, like, um, you know, Rare Earth Live in Concert, you know, was kind of a, you know, not, not a success. But most of the records I got were, and I find that like a marvel to me. And I think like I was lucky in some regards, and I possess some kind of basic intelligence 
to make that decision. Um, because again, it's a little hard to imagine for some of your listeners, but it was before any media on the computers, uh, things were newspapers. I might have read Rolling Stone magazine a few years later, but basically I was a, you know, overweight little kid in South San Francisco and my parents were really kind and great parents, but they listened to Tijuana Brass and stuff like that. Yeah, you know? real, yeah, oh yeah, pop, pop heaven right there. Yeah, and, and, and they were sensitive people, but, you know, it wasn't like, oh, you know, my parents were listening to, uh, you know, Wayne Shorter, you know, or something like that. <laughs> no, no, I want to, this is very important because I still feel at 46, I am operating on gumption spirit and what you just said was basic intelligence what are the antecedents to basic intelligence and i'm talking about why what 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 was the the antecedents of basic intelligence that led you to say i mean was it merely just like <clears throat> uh, you know these are these are not guys that are wearing suit suits that th th this is a no stick stick this is the album car, uh, cover art is psychedelic. You didn't necessarily know who the players were. So what was that? It was just it well, was innate, innate, innate consciousness. I mean, that's a million dollar question. Um, yep. I think about it all the time, but <laughs> I, 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 I do, you know, with I uh, dig. No, I dig. Um, but, you know, I did hear music coming from my sister's rooms. Um, I know I didn't like Bob Dylan. I liked Buffalo Springfield Rides Again. Like, that's what I'd hear through the wall. I did. Um, so there was some influence I, I heard. Um, and to this day, I'm not a big Bob Dylan fan, and I still really like Buffalo Springfield Rides Again. <laughs> you know, not to be sacrilegious, I know Bob Dylan is... So many people. Oh, no, dude, I get, I get it, man. I, I just I, you like know. melodic music, you know. Um, and so there was that, but I don't know. I mean, I guess, I mean, I think I'm a fairly average person, you know. I mean, for sure, in many ways, I could prove that in court, that I'm an average person. Um, and sometimes it does capture my imagination why I might see through certain uh, um, scenarios. <laughs> I'm really trying to choose my words and, and where others might not. Uh, and I think like that was an innate ability I had. And, and again, so the million dollar question is, okay, so there's a family, a broken home, they're in a trailer, uh, the father disappeared, and Mozart is one of the kids. <laughs> you know, that happens. And I, but I like, think, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, and I'm not saying that's me, but there are examples that are like that. And I find that reassuring in some ways. I think it's like some people are just born like, I mean, if we look at old entertainers like, uh, I don't know, the Marx Brothers or Henny Youngman or W.C. Fields, I'm sure their backgrounds are like really mediocre. Then there's like brilliant criminals uh, as well, like, who had nothing, you know, in fourth grade educations. And sure, they were evil and they hurt people and I don't promote that, but they had a basic, something was special, for lack of a better word, or extraordinary is a better word, about yeah. them. So I don't know. I do not know, Jake. And I don't know why a 12 year old kid wanted to hear John McLaughlin devotion. I mean, I, I mean, that, that, this is like the most profound, um, you know, I mean, I guess this is sort of where I, I lean away from, you know, uh, monotheistic 
dogmatic religion, but really lean into the idea that we're all gifted with our own genius in some way. And for you, even though it wasn't apparent at the time, it was obvious that you were going to operate on a certain frequency playing uh, instrumental melodic music uh, in your own way. Uh, you weren't trying to be Kenny Burrell or some Bob purist. You were going to be Jim Campolongo. That came along later. But I just wonder, I mean, and I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on this, but I just, you know, I got my older daughter. She's going to Princeton uh, starting her freshman year, and, you know, she's tweaking out about it. And I'm like, and, you know, we're dead. We, we are Tao, we are, we, we cultivate the Tao. We're not Taoists, but we're, we cultivate the Tao and it's following your true nature. And I'm trying to get her to just surrender to uh, source. Where do you come down on source? I mean, are you completely agnostic? Because I think at some point when you're talking about you being an average or mediocre cat in life, whatever that means, well, that's fine. But then you recognize what is mediocrity just by instinct. And it, it, that 12 year old boy was able to say, this is something sophisticated that I know nothing about, but I feel that this is something I need to, to at least try to shed on. Well, you know, I, I mean, the whole I'm mediocre thing, you know, is, I mean, compared to what, uh, you know, I mean, no, you're, you're, yeah. you're throwing down less McCann lines right now, huh? Compared to what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you know what? You, here's the here's the question. It's not about that. Are you agnostic, or do you believe that there is? Do you have a connection to source? Uh, I I take comfort in not knowing about an afterlife. Like, uh, do I believe in a higher power? You know, or a source, as you call it. Yes. Yes, that's that um, was my question because I think that yeah. that that, I that, take that comfort yeah. I take comfort in not knowing how to define it. I did. I did. I really did. Has that <clears throat> and and has that been um something that has come to your aid in your career? Like you said you, you said this is the million dollar question. You think about it all the time but yet I think, thinking about it, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's not like you're in sort of psych, some sort of psychic pain the way my daughter is right now, sort of turning herself in pretzels about this and that. It's more about you get comfort thinking about it. Well, about that specific thing, right? Um, you know, uh, I I don't I wouldn't describe myself as a comfortable person. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't think any good art comes yeah. from people that are that are comfortable. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I just talking to McLaughlin. I mean, the guy is just like a yes, he he, you know, it, these you have to be sort of totally over the edge to make quality art. Well, he's a good example of when I called myself mediocre. Like McLaughlin, of course, <laughs> works so hard. Like he's he speaks multi, he's multilingual. Um, He's a pioneer. He's a total genius. He's redefined who he is numerous times musically. Um, I mean, he's just such an exceptional person and he's boundlessly curious um, to me, you know, I, and he is a guy who I would love to meet. I mean, he's one of my real guitar heroes. Um, so compared to that, I feel pretty mediocre, but you're not the um, only one. I mean, he, intellectually, I feel completely me. Yeah, no, he, he's above and beyond. And yet, um, he also was cooking Indian food because <laughs> Sri, Sri Chimdoy said, so, you know, you're having some commercial successes early Maha with the first record on Columbia. They were about to start. Uh, <clears throat> they were touring. And Sri Chimdoy, he was living in an ashram. John was his ashram and said, he, Shri said, uh, John, the disciples need to eat. So you need to, you have some money. You need to uh, rent, a, find a, a, start cooking South Indian food for the disciples, make it cheap and, and, and tasty. And so here's McLaughlin coming off the road 
and having to cook for all these people that are in the ashram. And, you know, he said basically it was a test of saying, uh, well, just because you're getting famous, quote unquote, or you're having commercial success, are you still going to be able to keep both feet on the ground? So I think what makes him even more of an appealing person is just the mere fact that he got the message early on that uh, he needed to stay humble. <laughs> well, he he is truly outstanding um, and an inspiration, and he raises the bar. And uh, like many of us, many days, I mean, I, I sometimes think to myself, if I do everything I don't want to do today, I might have a good day. Damn. <laughs> Yo, I might, I might, I might get that. I don't have any tattoos. That might be my first tattoo, I think. <laughs> Well, there's another one my father used to say, Pete Campolongo, and he was, uh, he had a real dry sense of humor. He used to look at me and say, you know, I don't like to feel good. And, you know, after the first few times you hear it, you go, well, why, Dad? And you go, <laughs> well, it's how I feel before I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know it used to annoy me after a while you know i don't know how you if what kind of relationship if you had one with your father sure. but he'd say like the same thing a thousand times you know sometimes my dad would and you just and then it was like you know what's that called the stockholm syndrome right um, where I'd really appreciate it after like hating it. <laughs> I heard it so many times, but I think of it often now, you know, like it's almost profound advice, but yeah, the one I kind of th think about is if I do everything I don't want to do today, I might have a good day. You know, you know? I it just, it's so hard to do that. So then you over, if you can, and well, I guess also the other thing is just hitting on McLaughlin. He told this great story to me, you know, he was really one of those guys that like, in 2014 is when I first connected with him and you know I just he was so not just gracious but he went there with me and we were talking about this exact thing which is so uncanny is that you know you're talking he's like he raised he, before he became a disciple of Sri Chimno he, he, he saw him at a um, he saw, you know, he was giving a speech somewhere, Wesleyan or something, and, you know, John was probably around this devotion time, and he went up there, and and uh, Sri said, does anybody have any questions? He said, yes. He goes, you know, can you, uh, you know, uh, raise your level of consciousness? Uh, John was actually trying to really get back on a, on a straighter path and get off of hard drugs, and, you know, he said, can, you, can music <coughs> be... Um, uh, something that can help raise your, uh, your your level of consciousness and and and, and peace. And and Sri Chimnoy said, he goes, you know, that's a very good question. He's like, but you can do, have the same kind of revelation if you're sweeping the streets or you're cutting potatoes, you know, peeling potatoes. Like the point is, what you just said was, if I do everything I don't want to do today, I might have a good day. Really, the other part to that is, and this is the biggest struggle is. How much love are you going to put into the stuff you don't want to do today? What is your intention? How present in the moment? Are, I mean, that's what John was saying. He goes, you could be peeling potatoes. How much effort and energy and love are you going to put into that? Or you could be sweeping the street. I mean, that was profound. That was profound to him at the time. It didn't matter what you did. It was, that's really the goal of life is to say, lean, how much are you willing to suffer for love. That's it. That's what Alice Coltrane said to him. How much are you willing to suffer for love? So when you say the things that you don't want to do because you're dr dreading them, you're going to have a good day if you actually put heart, fire, and love into those activities. Anyway, that was sort of a Rubicon moment for me. And I always fall short because most times I'm always avoiding what I don't want. Well, you know, I mean, starting your day with sit-ups, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Uh, I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, you know, eating, yeah. uh, you know, a, a balanced breakfast instead of, you know, fill in the blank. Like, right. you know, I mean, then getting to really high level stuff of which, you know, I've I've never met John McLaughlin. You're sharing like some. No, I'm going to make that happen. I want to make I want to make oh. I, 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 I have 
I, I would. I I'm going to make that happen because, I, or at least talk to him on the phone. I'm telling you, this guy is so legendary because, and I can't imagine what it was like to, to listen to that early on or even see those concerts. But he, as a human being, like he went there with me, just the way you're going there with me. That this thing cat. Well, he's incredible. I I I, I know uh, Lainey Stern, who's friends with him. I used to get my guitar fixed by Flip Scipio, who knew him. Um, you know, I've gotten close, but I've never, I've, I've never, ha I, I, I'm just so in awe of him. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'm gonna, I, I'm, I, gonna I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make that happen. I'm gonna okay, do my best well, to make. It. You know, you even if it's just my name and say that, like, thank dude, you, on, dude, this... Campbell Longo. Honestly, man, like, um, the people that the respect that people have for you, like, I guarantee you, John McLaughlin knows who you are. Well, you know, maybe. And if he doesn't, he, he will. I mean, he's going to, it doesn't matter. I'm going to make that happen. Listen, I want to talk about something else for a minute here. <laughs> I want to mention one more. Go ahead, please. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay, it. just like I know we've beaten a dead horse, you know, the John McLaughlin no, interview with Jim Campolongo. Um, <laughs> I really no, but it's love... so important, man. It, this is, it's, it's about everything that it matters in life. So go ahead. <laughs> I, I, the record Love, Devotion, Surrender with Carlos Santana. Very familiar, is, yes. It is a really good, um, like, introductory record. I think it's great, but a Love Supreme on there. They do kind of a guitar duel. Yes. And, man, I mean, I mean, both guys, you know, Santana's at the top of his game, right? Um, but And he's growing, and McLaughlin's giving him... Uh, an arena to grow. But McLaughlin, I mean, is ripping on it. Like, I mean, you should check it out again and go, this is totally accessible rock guitar that influenced Jeff Beck, you know, had Carlos Santana learning. I mean, in a lot of ways, McLaughlin's, uh, you know, an easy listen. I mean, I think if somebody liked Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction, which I think is a great record, you know, they'd like Love, Devotion, Surrender, at least a Love Supreme. You know, it's it's just fantastic stuff. But anyway, you were going to no, ask I, me I a wanna, question. I, I, I want to I, I, I wanna ask you about this. I'm not going to I'm not going to do justice to the entire quote, but I really I just I, I've been on since I talked to you, I've just been like I, I don't know, Joe Zawinul came out of the heavens after I talked to you, and just a direct connection with Alex Acuna and Chester Thompson, who played in that incredible weather report group uh, in the mid-70s, the prior to Jocko coming, was Alfonso Johnson, Chester as that rhythm section. That might be the best weather report ever. And Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. I'm familiar with the Alfonso Johnson era. I really like it. Um, yeah, no, so Al Johnson, so they they brought in, Chester Thompson was playing with O'Donnell Levy. Do you know O'Donnell Levy, by the way? Just the name, just okay, the name. Okay, I'm going to say, dude, I hipped him to John Lee, John Lee Shannon freaked out because this guy was greasier and funkier, and I'm not kidding. Uh -huh. He was funkier than Grant Green, okay? And <laughs> I know that sounds insane. It, it, it was in Baltimore. So Chester started there, then he got hooked up with Zappa. And then he got hooked up with Weather Report. And they. so the point is that <clears throat> I've been on this binge. And last night, I just, I've been watching a couple of videos of them. And I'll send it to you. There's one, it, it's just profound stuff. And, and I love Al Johnson's playing. And so um, I, somehow my, on my YouTube feed, these, these Zappa interviews are coming up. And, and you know, and, and he's a guy who, you know, I mean, I could take it or leave it. I don't, I, I, I think some of the entertainment value of his shows leaves me a little bit less. I, but this, this band that he had with Chester Thompson and Ralph Humphrey, double drums, George Duke on all the keyboards, uh, Napoleon Murphy Brock on saxophone and vocals. I mean, that was my favorite band. So uh, there's this, there's this two minute interview. You've probably seen it where people are asking him about John McLaughlin. Have you seen that? I haven't seen it. Oh my God, you're going to, you know what? And I love it because Frank is just as competent intellectually as, as McLaughlin. I mean, he just was like such a, a serious dude. And he was just very honest about, he said, you know, man, they, they said, what do you think about um, 
I just I want you to see it for yourself. But basically, what 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 Frank was saying was, I mean, this was right at the beginning, I, kind of the devotion, early Maha stuff. But you know, the mothers were going on, and Frank said, he goes, you know, it's I think it's a it's a measure of amazing dexterity that you can run up and down, and play all the thesaurus of scales, this that and the other. I think it is worthy. He's like, I just I'm more into somebody who is going to really touch my heart and get me jumping out of my chair. I'm not into the intellectual, you know, and I don't know, he didn't necessarily name, he was an R&B and a blues guy, Gatemouth Brown, people like that. But it was, it did strike me as, for you to talk about, like, love, devotion, surrender, um, some of that music is... And it's my favorite people, Don Elias, Billy Cobb, Michael Shreve, Jan Hammer. Some of it's not, doesn't translate over. It does come across as a little bit vicious and not necessarily translatable. Frank's music is also like that too. But I, I feel like in some ways, John John's soloing sometimes can come across as a bit of an intellectual exercise as opposed to spontaneous, heartfelt, jumping out of my seat. Now, you might just sit there and say, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, but this... I know what you're talking about, yeah. and I okay. appreciate I really do. I know that's a cliche, like, you know, I appreciate it. No, I'm going to send you the clip, because it's going to make a lot... But you're gonna really I disagree. Yeah. I think yeah. McLaughlin uh, <laughs> captures uh, total energy. Um, right. And I find his phrases, like, sometimes uh, almost perplexing, like, as I listen but they're energetic and with 100% conviction. Like, and he's telling like a fascinating story to me that I, I, is in a different language sometimes than, you know, English. Uh, but <laughs> I mean, right. I find, I never find it like, oh, it's intellectual, um, you know, uh, and um, Zappa, I might not have great things to say. I was just listening to Zappa the other day off uh, Weasel's Eat Your Flesh. There's a track called Directly From My Heart to You with uh, Don Sugarcane Harris. And it's a oh, great, my God, it's a great blues, like like so high level. And yet, like, you know, the the cynicism and bathroom humor of Zappa uh, undermines like m my participation and embracing what he's doing. Um, and I've tried, I just don't like that in music. I'm not a big fan of cynicism. Uh, mm. and, and sure there's, sorry, that's me. No, that's, oh, me, that's, sending, that's okay. me sending you. I don't care. You got to get that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't, I know people who love Frank Zappa, like really love him. And, you know, Dweezil is spreading the word with uh, uh, Steve Vai, you know, I mean, guys that are just great, great musicians and artists. But for me, you know, it, it, it it's like I'll hear a really nice piece of music and kind of get on board. And then I start hearing, I want to fuck you in your poop shoot. You know, and it's no, like, I mean, dude, it, it's, it, it's it like, is what? Yeah. like, what? Yeah, no, it's, 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 I, I have to be honest. I, 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 so I've been sort of binging on this. It's just so great that we're talking about Johnny McLaughlin because, <laughs> I mean, Zappa, I'm not going to say he, uh, because when going back to Chester Thompson, the drummer, from, he eventually played with Genesis and, and Phil Collins. But when he was with, when he got pulled into the Frank uh, audition, uh, I mean, they literally, played the re the audition or rehearsal for over an hour, all different time changes, di different meters. I mean, th the guy could play anything, and yet he would go to the lowest common denominator and take you out of that groove. And 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 Fowler, the bass player who just passed, Tom Fowler, he said 80% of the crowd was dudes. So it was always about, like, and, and even this clip from the Roxy, that's insane. I mean, Zappa takes the grooviest, blues solo i've ever seen double drums he's got a stripper on stage that's like humping the guys i get it I, I, like it's i guess it was part of the shtick um i just it goes there's a for a variety of reasons um sometimes i just feel like he 
was just wanted to have too much. He didn't. He took the music seriously, but he actually uh, was somewhat unserious and kind of perverted and weird. You know, a little dirty in some ways. Yeah, it's really curious and 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 honestly, like I mean, and I'm enjoying talking about it, but I don't give it much thought. Um, I did see him interviewed when he was uh, protesting like ratings on records, and he's obviously like a really smart guy. Like, dude, he's um, dude. I'm um, this Mike Douglas interview from '76. I, I don't like, know, if, but he's a pro, genius. It, yeah, he's, he's a genius, genius too. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, he's, he's and, and yet, genius. like, I kind of discount. Uh, serious thought about the guy <laughs> you know just because it's like if if you're going to write a piece of music and have 10 time signatures in it and you know you need like the greatest drummer on planet earth to play it and then say uh don't eat yellow snow like <laughs> I, I i think like i don't know like it's it's not my cup of tea you know i dig it, you i dig it i just thought that i think that this the thing I just sent you is revelatory in the, and let me be very clear though. And I don't know if we, we didn't, uh, I didn't mention this to you before, <clears throat> but this is kind of cool going, cause I've interviewed all the guys, the original cats in Maha, the original band. And, um, you know, Zappa would not close the show for Maha Vishnu. He would not do it. Um, there were bands that just were, because what had, George Duke told the story, uh, there was some festival, jazz festival overseas. He was with Cannonball at the time. And Mahavishnu was just starting out. And they got up to open the show. And it was so insane that after the gig, after that, their set, the entire audience walked out of the venue. And Cannonball <laughs> still had a play. He, Cannonball still had a play, you know, yeah. and there was nobody there. So it became this joke, like, you can't close and Zappa would throw fits because they were on bills together and he was like i will not close for them so he was there's a little bit of that going on and then um <clears throat> quiz question for campolongo and, and it just nobody knows this there was only two cat there was only there was two bands one was the solo band solo act only two bands that would could open or close for mahavishnu orchestra I'm just going to give you. I want. I want you to try to guess. This is back well, in the Hayden. I mean, I would say Hendrix. Um, he was gone yeah. by that. He was kind of. He was. Oh. Jimmy died. You know, he was gone. So that oh, would have okay. been. Okay, so yeah. this is like, uh, what year are we talking? I about? mean, we're talking like '72. Phew. So I think Jimmy I, died. In, I don't think Jimmy. Jimmy died in '71 or something. I I don't know. I can't. Okay, this is, you're just going to love this so much. I just want to. The only two cat, the only two bands that had the balls to open and close for Maha, uh, Edgar uh, White Trash, Edgar Winters White Trash, uh -huh. and the other one is even more amazing, Solo Taj Mahal on Dobro. Wow, well that makes sense, and I actually saw uh, Beck Jeff Beck follow the Mahavishnu Orchestra. And uh, poor, and I love Jeff Beck. I think yeah. you do too. Jeff Beck came out with his tail between his legs, man. Now and you, so you know that you you were that you were there to witness it, man. I saw it, yeah. Um, and that's but, what I mean. We're talking that struck fear into Zappa, and that struck fear into you know even guys like Jerry Garcia. That he had a, a bill for with sure. McGlad, he's like he's like wow, man. He's like that guy, that guy plays a lot of notes. You know, he's like, he kind of freaked out. You know, and like anyway, you saw it firsthand. Yeah, I actually uh, did a gig once with uh, Taj Mahal. Yeah. And, and uh, we were, it was some live radio thing. And, but, so there was a, it was in a theater, but it was um, broadcast to the radio live. And both me and Taj Mahal were hanging out by the side of the stage, looking at the announcer. And Taj Mahal uh was waiting to be introduced and I was like shoulder to shoulder with him just enjoying the experience. Oh, and we, we didn't talk. And, and then the announcer and, and this is like got an ending here. I get, I think, yeah, I got my guitar. Um, yeah. We didn't talk cause I was a little shy and, and the announcer is like, all right, well, we're now going to bring up Taj. And when he says Taj and he's going to say Mahal, 
Taj Mahal looked at me, had his guitar on and goes, hey, you ever try this? And he walked away from me and then like got interviewed. And it was like the greatest lick, <laughs> you know, and I've, I've used it a million times. I don't know if you just heard it. Oh, um, yeah. OK. And it was amazing. And it was like he get, you know, wasn't show off. He he just gave me something like exactly. It was the most the highest level of art. Yeah, it was really great. And and I like I didn't even say thank you. I just kind of was astonished that it happened. And then I went home and played it. And it's such a great lick, like um, and useful. And I swear to God, I've I've put it like in every solo I've ever played. <laughs> that is unbelievable. I mean, you know, and, and this goes back just for the fun, because this has been absolutely invigorating for me to even spend this much time on this whole subject. But, you know, you the way you articulated McLaughlin coming from it from an energetic point of view, his playing. Uh, the the only reason that that those guys have the gumption to open and close is because they weren't trying. They, they knew that that energy that 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 little solo that he played for you, that was going to touch people's hearts. He was not insecure about going up head to head with the like it wasn't a, it wasn't an arms race. It wasn't it wasn't about facility and chops. I mean, Taj was up there singing and telling incredible stories and playing dobro. So to me, it was about the energetic, just the energy of it. No more, no less. It was and just what, real generous. And in a way, like, I don't think he heard me yet. And I was in the 10 gallon cats and we were like really flashy. Um, dude, but, I watched some of those clips, dude. That shit is out of hand. <laughs> thanks. Um, and just conceptually, and it's out of hand. He <laughs> and, and he like, it was like he knew exactly what I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just intrinsically, <laughs> he knew that. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Um, oh, I love this shit. I yeah, love it so much. All right, so let, I want to switch gears for a minute. <clears throat> I just did my an interview before I got on with you with um, an incredible keyboard player named Hubert Eaves, and he you know, played with, uh, just to give you an idea of this cat, he, he came from Minnesota, went on to play with Gary Bartz and the N2 Troop, and then um, uh, was <clears throat> playing at a club one night uh, with Spike Lee's dad on bass, and, and uh, who walks into the club but Thelonious Monk in the 70s in New York, when New York was a very drab and beautiful place to be, and uh, it turned out it was Thelonious's birthday, and Hubert Eves busts out uh, uh, around midnight, and uh, after he finishes, he looks around, and Thelonious just gives him a wink. All right, so this cat is, and so he, in the early 80s, he got together with James D. Train Williams, and they put out these, the, the, uh, this album, um, You're the One. There were a couple of major hits on it, and it was music, it was dance music um, with lyrics, and he was talking about, and these these couple of tunes on the on this record, it was from '82 on Prelude, East Coast stuff. <clears throat> a couple of these tunes took off so fast, they did not even have time to put a a band together. Um, and so they did these track dates in uh, in New York City, uh, all over the city, uh, where um, they would play uh, the these tunes. And I'm getting to the, my actual point here. But the point is that, that, so they're finished, they do their own thing. And then during intermission, that he said something completely profound. This is about 81, 82. He said, during intermission, these cats would come out and they started to twirl on their heads and break dance. Break dancing was not known at that time. Nothing. And it was like, he and D-Train would stand on the stage instead of sitting in the, in the green room or just chilling out, totally inspired by this new wave of break dancing. And this also coincides with kind of what was going on in the gang wars, what was happening in the Bronx in terms of sort of, you know, bulldozing people out of their homes. And 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 then obviously the advent of, you know, he, he followed that up by saying he had a meeting with Russell Simmons and Russell at the time wouldn't even look at him because... 
he wanted nothing to do with melodic music. He just he saw rhythm and uh, and rap as the as the future. And my point is that uh, you had this run. I'm just gonna pull it up here. <clears throat> you know, there was OJ Akamode in the Bay Area, and there was this band. Well, you got involved with Marcus Fellinger and wound up in the Renegades of Funk. Yeah. And I just, I, and I remember, I wanted you to talk about from a West Coast perspective, what was going on in the early 80s in terms of like, uh, you know, this, the, these new, the, how you adapted to this sort of new era of heavy, heavy rhythm, um, rap and breakdance. And then how you incorporated that in what kind of music you were playing in the Renegades of Funk? <laughs> well, that was a great era for me. Um, I mean, and a great era, era for the Bay Area. I mean, there was... Uh, Insane. You know, Betty Davis, Journey before Steve Perry, even though I like Steve Perry. Before um, Steve Ma Perry was key, yeah, that's right. Malo, uh, Tower of Power, um, Sly and the Family Stone, uh santana you know i mean and i'm forgetting like 10 people like and a lot of it was east bay you know and oh God. i hadn't really developed my own thing yet like um i was getting into country music and started to really want to play country music but the best musicians i knew were basically east got bay guys um uh, and Let's get some names on it. I love, I need to know yeah, late 70s East Bay. Eric McCann was on bass, great um, bass player. He played with the sax player from Bruce Springsteen for a while. A couple oh, of Clarence years Clemens, ago. yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Sly Randolph was on drums, a great drummer. Marcus Fillinger was on uh, keys. We had a, a couple rhythm guitarists. One guy was Victor... Takuko, I might be mispronouncing his word, his name, and he played rhythm guitar in Fela's band. Oh we my god! We had a very young Charlie Hunter play with us sometimes. Oh, um, wait, because because no, that is so insane. Because the Hunter I, Hunter's interview is one of my favorites because he was really a hippie. He was a yeah. true hippie. He I grew. Mean, he he, really he lived good. on a bus with his. He lived in Berkeley. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and our singer uh, was Arnold Elsey, uh, who was like a great singer, um, you know, could sing gospel, sang gospel in the church. And he ended up, uh, I hope he doesn't mind me calling him him. He ended up, uh, what do they call it, um, you know, transitioning and yeah. uh, into a woman. And he did mm -hmm. it while we were playing. And I remember... Um, I couldn't stop calling him Arnold, you know, like I uh, wanted yeah, it's the to. the same problem, and it, you know, and you're not doing it on, per it's not a malicious no, thing. No, no, uh, but uh. it was like, like I didn't want to disrespect him. So anyway, uh, we we would play quite, a, quite often, and we had some original stuff uh, that was quite good. It was a great band, and, you know, I had kind of learned how to play funk, um, more or less, you know, I was not a virtuoso, but Victor uh, taught me a lot. I learned a lot from Prince's rhythm mm -hmm. and that's the kind of thing we did. And I think it was back in the day when like Morris Day and the time were kind of big and there were uh, interracial bands, uh, but I never thought about it and nobody in the band thought about it. Um, you know, it wasn't like yeah, because that. Uh, I mean, that was that. That was the that was the whole vibe of where you were living. Yeah, it wasn't like a curated band of of, of na nationalities, kind of what I might see David Byrne do. You know, mm -hmm. these days, um, yeah. and uh, no disrespect, and no disrespect to his players because they're all great. But you know, it was just like nobody ever discussed it. I will say it was a little eye opening um, when we'd go into a restaurant as a band and stuff like that. Like I kind of vicariously uh, experienced a black experience at the time. And 
I guess like one could say, you know, I had white advantage up to that point um, and wasn't fully aware of like racism. But that said, you know, that's a small part of. Well, hold on. This is really I need, you know, you were on the ground just like you were on the ground to see Beck after McLaughlin, just like you were there at 12 years old, picking up extrapolation and devotion. What are you, I want you to go deeper on what you're talking about. Well, it, you know, uh, that's, I'm not sure like how deep it was. Like well, are you, You're talking about the vibe that you felt. Yeah, I mean, that happens sometimes, but I mean, to be honest, like I'm a 30 year old guy playing in a popular, fairly popular band that a million hot chicks would come to the gig. That's you know, great. I mean, like, I don't want to seem deeper than I was. And I'm not like, <laughs> no, but I mean, you know what it is? <laughs> I want to ask you because I mean, because, because most of my dearest musician friends in this in Tucson are the brothers. And I'm not a musician, but I've just, I've never felt, I just want to know what the vibe you're talking about, because was it because you were a white musician in a mixed race band or playing black soul clubs? Well, I never really experienced anything other than joy and yeah. uh, some humility, uh, but, you know, again, like we were a really popular band. Uh, girls really liked it, you know. Um, you know, it was more like that. But granted, you know, there were a few times where uh, I, and I was almost surprised that I'd experience prejudice because I might have been walking in or to a restaurant with six black guys or people and and me and i don't think people were shocked because it was mixed race i think i just felt that the, the mood of the room change totally, in a way totally, that i totally. never felt it be before that um but no, I, I you know what it is it still happened it's it, it's you know what nothing i i i i, I can walk into <coughs> this blues club here and just feel, you know, just in the service that I get. Um, it ultimately comes back to once, to me, once the, the bandmates make it, you know, very apparent that you're one of the cats, then all that kind of falls away. Yeah, I, and if it happened, uh, I wasn't aware of it, or if it didn't happen, I don't think it had happened. I mean, I, I know that... Uh, LZ, the singer, yeah. at the time, uh, I thought he was a gay black guy. Um, and I loved him, you know. But anyway, I got attacked by demonstrators on one of the wars we had, uh, you know, during the Reagan administration, because we're really going back. And people in the Bay Area were trying to block the bridge and blocking main streets and stuff like that. And I had a gig and I gently tried to go around one guy with a bike who was blocking this street. And it ended up being this thing where he called a bunch of people and said that I tried to run him over and they broke all my windows, flattened my tires and they were trying to drag me out of the car. Like you, this was in, this was in Oakland. No, this was in San Francisco on uh, uh, off Market Street, oh my and God. it was crazy. And dude, you know, I was like thirty years old and had like you know dyed blonde hair and a long earring. You know, I mean, I definitely didn't wasn't the prototype of the enemy. I mean, I was I didn't look like Dick Cheney, but nonetheless, <laughs> like, uh, these yeah, no, there was no you weren't Don Rumsfeld, dude. No, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. Um, anyway, um, and so after this event, I was uh, kind of afraid to leave the house. Like, I mean, I had glass in my eyes. I was put on trial. I, it, it's like way too long a story, but it lasted about two hours. Um, 
And finally, uh, you know, I, I walked home. I had to go get my car the next day and get tires for it. It was a piece of shit, but I got like four recaps. Anyway, so I was a little scared to leave the house. Like I was had been traumatized. And LZ personally came over my house because we had a gig and I was like, man, I don't want to go to the gig. You know, I, I just was scared and I'm not proud to admit it because I want to be like a tough guy, but I was scared. And LZ said, I'll come over your house and and we'll go to the gig together. And he wow. did. And this is a fairly, um, you know, uh, this he he was gay and you could tell right away like that kind of gay guy. And he was like, Jimmy, I'll come over. I'll come over and we'll go together, you know, and he called me Jimmy. And like if there was any, you know, acceptance from a brother, you know, like it transcended that. Like it was just an act of kindness and empathy. And I mean, I pretty much felt that way with the other dudes, you know, <laughs> like. No, I, that's, a, that's, a, that's a different level, though. I mean, that's a beautiful, I mean, and, and I can only think that being of that orientation at that time growing up, he probably it was all could completely relate to your to how you were feeling, even though it was a different situation. Yeah. Well well put and that's looking back, yeah. I he could relate to that in some way. But the other guys like, yeah, it, it just was like I never really thought about it. I might even think about it more now. I don't know, you know, but. Well, you think, I mean, I love that, that you're a thinker. I mean, this is like, did you, <laughs> did you, um, what, what, what was your experience? I mean, again, you were in that bastion uh, of, you know, just sort of that literally East Bay, Greece and the Bay Area. And there was a lot of political strife and, misdirected clearly because Scampolongo got caught in the middle of it. Um, were you guys um, still, when did you, when did it become like, um, I still feel like money for gigs for the gigs themselves at that time paid. Okay. Um, yeah. and, and, and I just wonder because that coincided a little bit or definitely in that late seventies, early or definitely early eighties where, a lot of club owners or restaurants that typically catered to seven nights a week of live music with human beings uh, started to recognize, hey, uh, uh, you know, it's just a lot more cost effective to, uh, you know, uh, just bring in some guy who's going to spin records and we don't need live music anymore. And I also just it just flashed in my head that around the same time, 7980 with Reagan coming in, there was this crackdown on, I don't want to say crackdown on hippies, but I remember Steve Kimmock telling me that in 79 in Berkeley, if you had a Bob Marley sticker on your car, the police were going to pull you over. Yeah. Wow. So it got real kind of dark. It got punitive. And I just, how much long, how long did you wind up staying? Did you, were you aware of that stuff or were you still just sort of, engrossed well, on trying to be a better musician. I mean, we were really against Reagan. Uh, I, be I belong to this uh, uh, quote unquote anarchist group called a commotion with a K. I wow. mean, but again, I wasn't like a really serious guy. I mean, I'd go there and they had dollar beer and there'd be, you know, I saw Buckethead play, Charlie <laughs> Hunter play, yeah. um, you Sick. know, so Joe Gore. Uh, and before that, I mean, I was kind of flirting around with the world beat scene here. And that's how I got in the Renegades of Funk. Um, and I don't know if you're aware, you know, it was Big City and the Looters and... Uh, um, Absolutely know. Big City, yeah. Yeah, okay. So I, I was... The world beat. What is that? I mean, you had you had cats coming over. Like I know OJ Akamode was there was yeah 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 Zipenzi or something like that. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I kind of got uh, you know, in, in introduced to all that by Marcus Fillinger, 
who was in the looters. And that was kind of the biggest thing in the Bay Area. Um, and that was part of my journey, you know, like oh. I got involved with that a little bit, uh, then started playing with Marcus, did some recording for Marcus, and then uh, Marcus got the Renegades of Funk together. So I was just kind of along for the ride. Sometimes I describe myself as like, yeah, I was like the white rock guy, you know, rock guitar player in the group, you know. <laughs> Um, I played a Strat with a vibrato bar. I used effects. I played through two amps in stereo, you know, but the whole time I was transitioning um, to country music and it became kind of a uh, du du duplicitous, I guess is the word, um, that I'd go play funk and then the whole for days afterwards, I would just listen to Jimmy Bryant, Speedy West, and Chet Atkins and try and learn that. And at a certain point, I felt like I wasn't being myself. Uh, and I made the jump to uh, play country music. Um, and the Renegades of Funk kind of had started to had run its course. And I got a band together with a guy named Van Riff. And we played country music. And that's when I started to kind of become, if I be so bold, Jim Campolongo. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, I want to be clear, because I actually think you've always been Jim Campolongo. But obviously, it's just like this sort of gestation, breaking out of the cocoon. Um, we're, even though you were the quote unquote, I mean, you that was your quote, the white rock guy. But um, do you feel like there were opportunities within the Renegades of Funk for you to get pushed out of your comfort zone. I mean, I think what I mean by that is like, you know, I just remember a story from Melvin Seals from the Grateful Dead, the organ player, you know, when, when he got into Jerry Garcia band, they wouldn't let him listen to anything from the Jerry Garcia band because then he'd want to sound like every one of those keyboardists. So, I mean, going back and listening to other kind of music, is I would only say, you know, help you um, in another type of, uh, you know, gig with in a different type of genre. But did you were there opportunities for you to increase did the sonic nature and crew improve your vibrato? Did, were you able to stretch out? It was, it was like total freedom for me. Um, you know, it would be 48 bars in E minor, <laughs> you know. Uh, over like a killing groove and, uh, you know, a packed house dancing. Um, oh, my God. And, That's it. And I would say like my style had more effects on it. Like I would use feedback and things like that, um, which I had to nurture myself away from. I mean, to the I think one of the reasons why I, you know, play a Telecaster and get different sounds that not everyone does is because I I'm trying to replicate the sounds I could get with a vibrato bar and distortion through amps that were, you know, on 11, <laughs> you know, oh, um, but I mean, it wouldn't be classic, you know, whatever I'm known for, like maybe an atmospheric telly sound, but I was definitely not, uh, you know, you like, weren't a trad. Yeah, it wasn't trad. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I, it I, wasn't yeah. twiddly, 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 yeah. wee, you know, or or hair metal, you know, kind of uh, thing. So I love it. it. Actually, it really sounds somewhat sophisticated. I mean, it was really fun, man. It yeah. was really fun. Um, yeah, that, that that's what, what it sounds like to me is that it was more it was more about fun. I mean, you were packing the hat. What kind of do you remember the names of the clubs you would play? Yeah, I mean, the one I really remember is we play Paradise Downstairs either on a Friday or a Saturday. That was in we Oakland or San Fran? San Fran. Wow. I mean, that kind of band. We did a lot of private parties in Oakland. And the thing about that band is, like, I think we'd open up with uh, Get Down Tonight, you know, by Casey and the Sunshine Band. <laughs> I mean, we were not testing people's... Uh, you know, uh, taste, you know, like, 
like, okay, uh, we're going to challenge you now with this song. You know, it was like the great party band, you know. Uh, so Absolutely. I mean, yeah, well, I mean, that, yeah, you weren't, or the, and so some, were you writing some original tunes too? I mean, they must, and they were sort of in the same kind of, yeah, party vein. we we started to do that. I, I it, it, you're the first guy I've ever talked to about this, like in my life. Okay, because yeah, I did. I was. I did. I I went to bed last night. I'm like, I was doing research. I'm like, I got to do some shedding for this interview. And, and, <laughs> well, and you when sure I did, man. <laughs> well, no, but you know what? It didn't take. It was painless because there's so much in on the on the board. I just saw this. I mean, I'm really fat. We could talk for hours about. The, the this cat uh, I mean uh, I mean it's uh, pre uh, Dillinger, Dillinger is just blow I the fact that I'm like this was going on in the bay and this is the greatest and because I didn't know anything about it yeah well um you know it was a little under the radar and maybe deservingly so we weren't like uh the freaky executives or somebody like that who was like right. Uh, playing like original music with an original concept. We had some, and if memory serves me correct, they were kind of group efforts. Like we'd play a groove and dig it. Um, and then maybe uh, LZ would put some lyrics over it and then somebody might suggest a bridge. I love um, this. You know, so, but like even talking to you, Jake, like <clears throat> is, is uh, you know, I remember how, fun it was, um, you know, and I, at the time, like, <clears throat> I mean, people ask me, like, I mean, I started to kind of get serious when I was 30, maybe 31, took me forever, like, to kind of come up with my own thing. I mean, you guys got guys like John Lee Shannon, you know, oh, my hero, dude, Jesus. The guy, the guy I mean, I don't, even, I don't know. I mean, that dude, is the great. first of all, that's the that's the greatest thing is that the impact that you've had on some of my dearest, they love you, man. I mean, that's all that matters. At the end of the day, you could have done nothing. I mean, you, <laughs> what whatever you did to, to Roy, <clears throat> but more specific, I mean, to Zeph, is, I mean, and, you know, Zeph, that's a whole other conversation. But those guys have meant more to me spiritually. And the, just, and the fact is, that I'm like, I'm in one of my interviews with John, I was like, you know who's some of these? Who's an elder you can point to? And he's like Campo Longo, man. Well, and, that's I mean, really just, but I mean, John. John is also humble too. Like he's probably, you know, if he ever hears this, I mean, he's somewhere in that vein where, you know, because I think whatever that means, starting to take yourself seriously or be yourself. I mean, when you do that and you sort of take that jump, um, I mean, part of music, it's really all about having a, having fun. I mean, that's what David Crosby and Garcia were all about. They just wanted to have fun. And so when you start to take that jump, and then all of a sudden some of that, it, it gets a little bit more, it gets heavier, and it gets maybe less inspiring and fun. Well, I, I'm not completely certain of, of, of John uh, Shannon's uh, origin story and all that, but, he, you know, I know for me, like, it seemed like John did it really smart he got really good and then jumped to a high level like not only as a solo player but just in his career where i like you know it took me like 12 years of like playing and i don't i'm not discounting the renegades of funk but i just didn't think about it that much like i did but you know, when I hit about 30, 31, I was just, and, and Charlie Hunter was a big influence on me. I remember thinking like seeing Charlie play and think Charlie could show up to a bus station in France and make money like the way he <laughs> and, and it yeah. started yeah. to occur to me that I should be better than the confines of my band. Um, and before that, I was a band guy, I got kind of lucky here and there. I got to play with the Renegades of Funk. But, you know, I was kind of in it for the party a little bit, you know. I mean, um, but I also want to be clear. <clears throat> I mean, I'll send you some, a couple, my first interview with John is pretty revelatory because, um, you know, he walked away from music for quite a while. And then people like you, or Zeph, 
uh, helped him get back into it. And I'm talking not that long. I'm talking the Obama years. <laughs> so, I mean, but I also think just let's be clear. You couldn't you didn't have to grow up so quickly back then. You had money and you were actually able to get ahead. I mean, I'm not talking you weren't living in the Berkeley Hills, but you know what? You were making the cost of living was completely reasonable. You were able to pay the bills. It was cool to have fun because you weren't drowning. Now it's like, <laughs> yeah. now it's like, it, you know, you're still doing it. And just to put a tour together, just to come out in the black, I mean, it's, it's a drag, you know? Well, so like, I mean, so part of it's like, yeah, you could say you didn't get serious or find your voice. Yeah. You were having fun because you know why? Because you were actually able to get ahead a little bit. There's truth to that, and we, we touched upon it on our last interview where that's my concern for younger players is they don't have a, a venue to work on their craft. And right. in some ways, like, I might have milked it dry a little too much, you know? Um, <laughs> well, that's but, possible. That's possible. But yeah. yeah, but you're right. Like, I mean, we were, I mean, I remember making a hundred bucks you know, and my rent was like two fifty. Exactly, you know? exactly. A good weekend. Yeah. You make it in one weekend. You know. Yeah, and and you know, not really keeping track of what I spent. I mean, a few times I had to sell guitars to like make that pit, you know, little pittance of a rent. But it was things were easier in that regard. Um, and it's a concern I have for younger players who I think are fantastic. Um, but you can't, you know, like I said in the last interview, I played, you know, uh, in commercial bands who were making money because I could play like a Doobie Brothers song or a Cars song, you know, or something oh. like that. Oh, um, and, you know, when I'd get home, like I'd want to work on blues and muddy waters and all that. But Again, like, you know, the uh, if I do everything I want to do, I might have a good day. That was definitely not my motto. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that is still the, the that's the, that is the holy grail. I mean, that's the most profound thing that we've talked about in the two hours of interviews we've done. Because that, to be, that is what it's about. <clears throat> but the thing is that on top of that, you know, you were the, right when you started to start to really put the big, take the training wheels off, so to speak, Renegades of Funk, that kind of stuff. You know, you, you were playing. There wasn't a lot of air conditioning. You didn't need it in the Bay Area. There, um, like I said, the the disco, the uh, advent of a DJ or the Gloria Gaynor, you're, you're, people were still coming to burn viscerally to the music. You were playing to sweaty crowds who were getting off and i still and I, like today it's like oh you didn't sell enough tickets for the gig i mean i don't even know how you promote now but it's like they cancel gigs if you don't sell enough tickets in advance i mean the significance of live music has just changed fundamentally so much and i'm not saying we can't get back to a a state that but i mean you lived through this time where you were like wow maybe you weren't internalizing it but it was like not only was it fun, but it was actually seen as like a viable profession. And people well, were still going, I mean, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I just, I mean, like, to that's me, like. That's two different things. And, and yeah. to address the first one, again, like, I'm not sure. Like, certainly it's not 1981 or two. Um, and like uh, live music every two, you know, doors at a bar. And no DJs and people dance. But, you know, I was talking to Sam Ryder, who's 30 years old, who plays accordion, and uh, he's, he's fantastic. I mean, he's, he's a fantastic musician. He plays with Roy Williams, Roy Williams. Oh, yeah, band. yeah, I think I saw that. Yeah, Roy Williams. Yeah, he just yeah, put out level. a new record. And I asked him, I said, what's up with, like, young people? Like, do, do they go out still? And he, and Sam told me, Every weekend, his friends call him up to go see music, but it's like more of a community thing, like like a, a Grateful Dead kind of thing, like a community of people 
also hearing music, maybe going and uh, to a venue and taking some acts like maybe like Right, more of, of a burning man kind of thing. And he said, yeah, I mean, my friends aren't going to go to freight and salvage and sit down for an hour and a half. that you know, good for you know that 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 you're you're so, you know, but it's even you know, <laughs> wow, man, that that's a brilliantly artistic. It is more communal. Um, there absolutely is more sort of uh, pop up. sort of events, so to speak. Um, uh, but yet, even the Roxy, I'm not sure if you ever played the Roxy in LA before, but, you know, I'm going back to Zappa, I'm watching this insane video from 1973 with George Duke and double drums, and 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 I'm like, this, I'm, I was like dancing, I was like having, this is last night, and I'm looking at, and then when they pan out, people are all just sitting down. So I'm like, maybe, maybe it was just the Grateful Dead shows where people danced, you know, like, but now you're saying these funk gigs. I mean, to me, it's like, I think that every music, atonal music is music is made for dancing. And I just feel like in some ways that these larger venues, these freight and salvages or these other, it's, it's just like, it's made for, I don't want to say pacification, but it's made for people that to like atrophy in their chair. And I can't handle that. Yeah, I mean, I'm I, I I'm really I mean, you may you may not want Jake Feinberg at the Lunatico show, but I guarantee you we're going to raise the frequency there because it's going to get it's going to we're going to burn really hard. I mean, I'm very hesitant to judge, Yeah. you know, and it's kind of like it's Yeah, reel very me back in, all right? it's Yeah. very it's very easy for me to like see Jimi Hendrix, you know, and go, wow, like that era is not to be equaled and certainly not now. Okay, like, but I, I don't want to say that because I don't know. Like, and I think I mentioned Bill Maher last interview. Like, I don't, I, I find him very uh, disagreeable. You know, he's like a crabby old man and, you know, always romanticizing Yeah. like Yeah. when he was 30. But it's when you're 30. Like when I was 30, I was a totally different guy. I wasn't getting pissed off because I'm booking hotel in Portland. You know, I was waking up at like 11 o'clock and thinking, hey, I'll go to Hamburger Mary's, you know, I mean, and, 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 Right, and, right. and, and, and yeah, people danced. I mean, I, I, I do find it curious that like on Instagram, I see many videos of people dancing by themselves. Like, I mean, it's almost like you don't see people dancing together as much as you see people dancing by themselves being a little demonstrative. But again, like, I don't know, like, I want to just go with that again. I, I mean, I am 66 years old. Uh, I don't go Going out on, and go, you're not. going on 12 years old, man. I mean, you're <laughs> yeah, still in I mean, that store getting that extrapolation record. look like we're hip. I'm hip. You're hip. <laughs> I'm curious still. yeah. We're talking. We're impassioned. Like, you know, I, I, I'm proud of us in this conversation, but I will go back on like, I really don't know. Like, you know, maybe there's a 28 year old going out and dancing his ass off and meeting girls. And, you know, I don't know, maybe it's a DJ, but Man, he knows the DJ and Well, let probably me, let me can't. just, I mean, I want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, cause the horse has been dead for about two hours now, but I do want to say like, I have been, I am boots on the ground, especially coming out of COVID and <clears throat> the two revelatory things as a patron <clears throat> for the music, the amount of times that I've gone to see, and we have great musicians in this town as anybody, guys that have been doing it like you for decades. They're plugged in. They're playing electric, trio, psychedelic, blues music. It's dance music. And the amount of times that I get a bartender at, during intermission saying, hey, man, listen, you know, I'm getting a lot of complaints from people about you being up at the front, you know, doing your thing. I'm dancing. I'm, I'm liberating. 
And he's like, can you just sit down? I'm like, sit down? Music is made for dancing. Okay, so that's one thing that has fundamentally changed in our culture. <clears throat> not that people didn't sit and, 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 and observe music, but I'm not talking about a folk gig. I'm not talking about a symphonic gig. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing is, I like to get up right in front of the bandstand. And I'm not talking about like, you know, where there's, it's a riser, they're off the ground. And I'm up there conducting, having, out, you know, out of body experiences, having a ball. And the, the band will say 45 minutes in, guys, there's no harm. Come up and join us. People are just so afraid to get into the, the collective consciousness of driving. I mean, the band needs fuel too. Yeah. So I'm just saying there are things going on and I'm going to stay with you in the, I don't know. I'm just saying like you don't know, cause you're not out there six nights a week, burning it up. You're the, the accordion cat is right. I'm just saying there are, I don't want to say ethics, but like the idea that some, that this is a band that I love. And, and the amount of times people are saying you're blocking my view. Well, Okay, if you're in a wheelchair, if you don't have the ability to move, then I will move. But otherwise, get off your ass and move. Because this is dance music. This isn't some sort of folk gig. Well, Give me I, a break. I can't disagree with you. And I do find, like, I'm going back to uh, Buenos Aires again uh, yeah. for almost two months. And <laughs> That's the unbelievable. Audience, the audiences there are way more physical. And exactly. Little, the physicality is what I'm, that was the word yeah, I'm looking for. I mean, yeah. you know, to sum, put that in a word of what you're describing. And my experience, you know, as an old guy, like when I play Skinny Dennis in Brooklyn, there have been times where, and with Zeph, Zeph and I, O'Hora, we'd end oh, my song hero. And I think that was fantastic. Like, you know, like what he did and what the band did, if I be so bold. And not a single person would applause, applaud. And I'd look out and people were on their phones. And when we'd play, everyone would be coming up and taking selfies. But when we stop the song, there'd be nothing back. Nothing. Insane. Like, You're nailing it, dude. In the jazz show I just was at this weekend, ripping some of the stuff i put up online ripping solos and they go back into the music and i'm cl i'm the only one clapping i don't think people even know how to deal with they don't know anymore i, I don't know what it is you, I don't you just, know what it, it is it's, either. it's so and I, I also think it's also what you talk about dancing in isolation or everyone's in their own bag and the thing about me is like i just realized viscerally and, and i wouldn't do it if the musicians weren't getting off but my God, they need the fuel too. I mean, they need yeah. it going back to them. It's not, you're not being discourteous. I mean, we also live in this, let's be clear. I mean, you were getting your tires slashed and you were, you know, you were getting harassed and it doesn't sound fun. You were in jail. Um, we didn't have this, and I'm I'm a pretty tolerant person, but what they call it woke or whatever, but it's like those kinds of things have in, in, have really encringed more in this country They've infringed, they've impeded on people to be themselves and liberate because people are, are overly concerned with their own space. They're, they're, they're consumed with their own thing. I've never understood this idea of like new media. It's not social media. Stop taking selfies. Stop advertising yourself. I would never respect myself if I was promoting myself. Promote something th that's that's burning, and and I just feel like in general that people are so out in their own world that like when Zeph's playing, when you guys hit that, when you hit it on that country tune, that high lonesome sound, and and all of a sudden it's like, or you rip off a solo and the band's still playing, I'm clapping because that's what you do with live music, and yet nobody else claps, nobody even understands why they probably think it's rude. I mean, it's it's gotten very, it's been turned on its head. That being said, I still want to stay in the I don't know because there are amazing musicians. It's just, there are barriers around the ability to be physical within the music, become part of the music. That's really what it's about. 
And yeah. that is the part, I mean, that's what you're talking about with at that place in the basement in San Francisco, the sweaty Friday and Saturday nights, dude. Um, and that still goes on. Don't get me wrong, but that's more like, that's less with like actual bands and more like that rave situation, you know, where it's much more individualistic. You're much more in your own headspace and it's somebody just ripping it off. It's not reacting to the groove and being able to stretch somebody out to go even longer. And that's what I do with John Lee. I mean, these guys love it. And, you know, and, but the audiences, man, they really uptight. Man. And so it, it's just, listen, I, I've been babbling myself into oblivion. Can we, we got to, we got to, we got at least another set in us. Dude. Can we do one more set? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean, I kind of felt like, you know, uh, I wouldn't have anything to say, but obviously we did. Um, and... No, there's just a lot. You know what it is? Uh, there, it, it, there's just there's a few more things I definitely wanted to get to with you. Um, okay. Get off the sort of self righteous stump, so to speak. Well, uh, but I, but yeah, it, it's. I mean, it, they're all really good points. You know, um, that I again, I think about this. I talk about this with my friends. Um, and again, I kind of just go with, uh, well, I kind of don't know, but I did ask Sam Ryder, like I, the young guys I know, I ask them, you know, what do you do? What's your, what's your experience? You know, I want to learn from them and find out what's up. Um, well, no, let me, let me also explain, <clears throat> like what he's talking about is like, there's a commune here in Tucson, it's like five different houses. One of them has been designated for a, a space for music. There's no air conditioning. There's just a swamp cooler. You can't sell alcohol there. You can get water. It's a very cool, young space. Um, but as far as monetizing that, like that's the vibe and that's what's going on. But as far as that being a commercial opportunity, uh, you know, they, they rely on donations. That's where we're at with live music now, with real human beings. It's it's yeah. about philanthropy. It's going to have to go back to philanthropy. Maybe it's always been philanthropy, but, you know, I mean, the idea that in 81, 82, unbeknownst to Campolongo, you were still getting cost of living increases on your gigs. Now John Lee Shannon has to finish a Circles gig, <laughs> playing his ass off, and the only way that they get ahead is by go rushing to the merch table and having to put on a smile for two hours while they sell <laughs> merch and I mean, yeah. that's where it's at. Yeah. I mean, uh, in closing, I guess, because, you know, it sounds like. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, I, we could go on forever, but I'm just, I just sort of, like, I did, I blew through I, that McLaughlin I, thing. I, 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 I really appreciate, uh, you know, some a punk rock, like, quote unquote, like yeah. punk rock. And, uh, you know, the uh, uh, decline of Western civilization, the first ones really. Uh, inspiring and seeing the germs. But my point is, is like, I've gone and watched like a video of minor threat, like, wow. and I don't know what year it is, maybe 81, 82. And it is the most hellish thing. Like, it looks like, you know, humanity has turned into a bunch of worms or something. Oh, wow. That's what I'm like, talking about. They're they're flying all over. They're ramming into each other. The band is like, you know, <laughs> high, high energy is an understatement. Um, and it's really exciting. And every time I look at it, I think, what happened to that? You got and, it, bro. There you go. Mutant, <laughs> let's just put it like this. <clears throat> That is called a visceral burn, okay? And hopefully nobody got hurt, but everybody was having a ball. But let's just put it like this. John, not putting genres in there. Music today is made for pacification. I think I told you last time, maybe not. David Spinoza, legendary guitar player. Yeah, it's great producer music to talk to. Talk exactly. To talk. He, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so I you're disrupting. You're disrupting somebody's social time because you're trying to get back to minor threat days. That's the issue. One of them. Well, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for that, and we don't have time, and I won't pinpoint them. But I yeah, mean, no. Let's get into it. We got more. We got a lot more. I got a few more things. Just, 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 a, just to give an idea here. I got. It. Steve, I'm going to pronounce his last name wrong, uh, 
Cardenas. Uh, what's this? Steve, Steve Cardenas. I wanted to talk about that. Uh, a Cardenas. Yeah. Cardenas. Yeah. No. So we have a lot. There's a lot more of your history. I just I would love to have you articulate because you were there. It. Yeah. I mean, I'm in. I'm in, I'm around until the end of August. The sooner, the better, because things start getting like to crunch. Okay. Time. I'm going to throw out a couple of days. I'm, I'm taking my older daughter to, to Princeton for college. Uh, when I and I'll be back on the 23rd, so maybe we can get do it in those final days before. What day are you leaving? Uh, I'm leaving the 31st, but things get crazy. But that could be possible. And usually, right, I'll throw some dates and times. So, I mean, we'll we'll uh, yeah, we're just we're just we're cooking away here, JC. All right. I I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it, Jake. Thanks so much. <laughs> uh, no, man. Thank you, man. It's okay, good time. Well, have a good day. Send me a couple emails, and we'll do part three. <laughs> I can't wait, dude. Right, okay. Minor threat, dude. Minor threat. <laughs> okay. Take care, Jake. Yeah. Be cool, man. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.